welcome back. I'm Michael Stamatinos, your host with the Advancing Healthcare Innovation Show. And if you're new to us, we're super excited to have you here because we bring exciting conversations with leaders who are painstakingly shaping the future of healthcare. And we happen to be crazy passionate around innovation, adoption, access, and leadership. And if it's your first time tuning in, let me just tell you a little bit about what we do here. So we are a healthcare innovation company. We're focused on bringing real stories of people that are truly innovating within healthcare to life. Our aim is bringing these folks, giving them a platform to share their stories with the world. If you haven't checked us out already, make sure you hit the subscribe button now. We've got an incredibly action-packed year planned with some new amazing content, but if you want to check out some of the older interviews, make sure you go and do that too. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm just super excited today because I'm delighted to introduce a true trailblazer in healthcare innovation, a distinguished figure who's been transforming the healthcare landscape. It's Lenia Chan. With over 24 years uh, and a very robust track record in leading a wide range of verticals, such as health systems, nonprofit organizations, and distressed companies, Lenny's carved out a reputation as a seasoned healthcare executive clinician and an operator. Currently, Lenny serves as the president of Live On New York, a nonprofit organ procurement organization that fervently works towards saving lives 365 days a year honoring donors' wishes and raising awareness about organ and tissue donation uh, among individuals. So he's responsible for serving a a population of 13 million people in the greater New York City metro area. And through Lenny's leadership and steerage, Live On New York fortifies its mission to make New York number one in lives saved through organ donation. So Lenny's passion lies in helping organizations create value for the community through change management and transformation. So Lenny, welcome. Just super thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Honored to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to share a bit about my story and community service. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So maybe before we dig into a bit of your background, how do you define innovation? What's innovation to you? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I mean, um, uh, you know, it means so many different things to me. Uh, but you know, there's there's not there's not a lot of novel things out there when you look at it. That's why I kind of hesitate as I think about it. I mean, you know, science exists, technology changes that innovation to me. You know, in the healthcare arena, is the application of it right? It's the change management, the gastrointestinal fortitude, the effort and operating style of organizations and people who are entrepreneurial, who want to take risk, um, who want to change things, right? And, um, you know, I've been around, I guess, a quarter of a century in healthcare to see cycles of things that are called innovation um, that maybe are not. So there's a lot of still confusion in the marketplace about what it is. But to me, it's it's value creation through trying, trying to aspire to and drive either new and novel ideas or amplifying, changing, modifying, scaling, or accelerating um, ideas or processes through, you know, intellectual capital, human capital, uh, financial capital, and driving those to commercialization. Um, Not in the uh, finance sense of the world of commercialization, but in healthcare, scaling value, identifying value, creating value, um, sponsoring value, and then fighting the good fight within healthcare to bring that to the market for much more than an N of one and apply that to mass populations. Um, so that, that's what it's been to me in healthcare. And again, there's an operating part of that, um, which people believe and think, you know, everything is innovative, even though there's a, you know, repeating cycle of things that could be done every 20 years or 15 years or five years. Um, and then there's another side of that um, which is really technology transfer, intellectual property, commercialization. Um, and then there are the moonshotters who are thinking of how to transform the universe um, and everything with it uh, to improve healthcare um, or whatever sector they're in to just uh, take things to a totally different level. Um, the mavericks and trailblazers and people who want to truly try to create and think of novel um, technologies, applications, processes. Um, to help improve healthcare across the world. Amazing. When you when you think about your journey, 
and you think about sort of the other tours of duty that you've done and now leading Live On New York, uh, we haven't interviewed any anyone else that's sort of within your niche, within your space. What what attracted you to Live On New York, to this calling and and wanting to, to sort of make this this transformation? Because it, it appears as though that there's, having dug into organ donation and the logistics behind it, it's um, it's something that I think is absolutely yearning for innovation. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, and I'll speak about it in a few different ways. So I'm not, you know, I'm not a person that's from the OPO industry, the organ procurement organization industry or donation and transplantation community per se, right? That is a, a slice of healthcare. Um, I've been in through all of it, right? Um, 25 years, started my career as a nurse, MICU nurse, ICU nurse, and then have done 15 different leadership and executive roles um, through my career. Um, when you tie the beginning of my career to where I am today and why I'm here, uh, you know, when I was a nurse, when I was an ICU nurse, and when I look back, we did not know a lot about organ donation. Um, even in New York, and I'll speak about New York, but through the several academic medical centers I've been to with schools associated to and through all of my education and training as a nurse, as a nurse practitioner, even in the business logistics community, education community, um, organ donation isn't a discipline within medicine or nursing or healthcare. It doesn't really have champions per se in the traditional infrastructure. And when I first heard, uh, when a recruiter called me, and you know, it's a bit of a longer story, but when a recruiter called me about this opportunity, and I started to look at the numbers as a born and raised New Yorker of what my own community, my neighbors, friends, family, and people I didn't know who were just part of our community had gone through and that it wasn't the best at something. In fact, it was one of the worst in the country. It ripped my heart out. And it ripped my heart out because in synthesizing that messaging and hearing that recruiter speak to me and show me some data, I realized that I had gone then 22, 23 years of my career without not only making a major contribution to the act of donation, but being completely ignorant about the impact that it has generationally um, on people's lives. And not only from a lifestyle and quality of life and clinical and human component, but all the way downstream into the economic components of it across the United States and the globe. And again, we could get into that. So in that whole few minutes, I actually felt the feeling of being ashamed. That was what I remember. And I remember knowing I was in trouble in that moment because through my entire voyage, I had missed something that was so important and could have dramatically changed so many lives. And what I knew in that instance was I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone in not knowing better that through my voyage, I would have crossed paths. I would have learned, I would have been able to engage, but it just wasn't in our ecosystem. It wasn't a part of our culture. And to a great, you know, to 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 a great um, part, it still remains not a big part of our culture, and we're changing that. So I thought for a moment, and I said, okay, if 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 I haven't not only contributed to it, but maybe even was on the other side of it, maybe mm -hmm. I even believe, and I'll I'll say today, yeah, I believe a lot of these legends, these myths, these urban legends around donation. Um, well, if that's true of me, then could I work with a team and create a strategic plan to counter that? Because I was an instant convert in that moment, realizing, wow, I missed this opportunity to change a microcosm of healthcare and bring uh, a benefit to community through service. And it really, really hit me hard. And I thought, wow, this is like the prosecutor becoming a defense attorney or a police officer becoming internal affairs or the, it, I was the other side of the coin per se. So could a strategic plan be written? Could something be designed? Do I believe that I'm not just an N of one, but through my voyage, everyone around me may have also not had the blank filled in for them to know that a single organ donor could save eight lives, that a tissue donor could change the lives of 75 people, that half of the people that are probably listening today have a dental procedure or may have torn an ACL or MCL or a tendon, 
and thought they were getting something that was manufactured in a factory when it actually came from a gracious tissue donor, right? All of these things blew my mind in that moment. And here I am. Here I am to hopefully make a contribution to help to change a culture and to help um, honor our community. People who say yes to donation, who are underrepresented because donation isn't a discipline. And the origin of Oregon procurement organizations was for us to stand in that fray to honor as a trustee, if you will, right? Or a steward of someone's wishes, no differently than a will, to yes. say that these individuals are leaving the most precious gift you could give to someone. Not money, not a car, not a house, not real estate, not the traditional things that may be put into a will, but the gift of life to strangers. Um, that fascinated me. And, and looking at the entire healthcare ecosystem, we've gotten far away from the original intent of the late 60s, 70s, early 80s, when all of these regs and laws were changed to put advocates to stand there for community in a moment where they were voiceless and challenge convention and honor their wishes with the end result being saving people's lives on the transplant wait list across the nation. So yeah, so that's that's kind of how I got here. So uh, that first moment of shame, that second moment of an awakening, that third moment of can I make a contribution to my former self, whether a nurse, an executive, a, a, a son of of New York, a, a son of the medical and health systems of our ecosystem, could I could I make a contribution in sharing that story and do something about it? And that led me to where I am today. Incredible. It's, it's, this isn't a job for you. This is a, this is a calling. You've been called to Absolutely. lead this. That's amazing. Yes. Well, and it's our community. What are, you mentioned, you mentioned myths. What are some of those myths that I think maybe we've been led to believe that you kind of want to demystify? And... Or, yeah, some of these myths that I may have believed myself. And again, I'm, I'm throwing that out there to the audience. I mean, uh, I'm not a lay person per se. I'm, I'm healthcare through and through. I, I've um, been in it since obviously I was a student in undergrad and um, through this moment today that I'm sitting here with you. Uh, some of those myths that even I may have believed only three, four, five years ago, just to put, to put that, to really hammer that home, um, are that most major religions are against donation, just not true. Um, we've spoken with, you know, the leaders of every major religion um, all religions support donation. Uh, when you get into the detail of that and you think of being able to save a life, uh, that plays a yeah. lot in some of the major religions. So that's that's one thing. Um, there's a lot of documents around that, a lot of publications and written content around it, and a conversation that, you know, if you have, you know, um, you know, with your leader um, or clergy or pastor or, or rabbi or imam, whoever it is, and you have that conversation about life, you'll find that major religions support donation. Um, another one that really hits home to most people that they mo mostly get from Hollywood is, um, hey, if I get in an accident or I have to go to an emergency room, um, they're not going to save my life because somebody wants my organs. And there's this big conspiracy around, oh, uh, if I get sick or I end up in a car accident, so they're not going to save my life because I'm an organ donor and people for that reason don't sign up to be on the registry, right? And here's the reality of that. Um, you know, speaking as somebody in this role now for almost two years, but also speaking as a nurse and a healthcare person and everything else. The reality is um, nobody in that emergency room knows you're an organ donor. Nobody's looking at your license. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got an organ donor here. <laughs> An emergency room physician, an emergency emergency room nurses, paramedics, EMTs in the community, the last thing they worry about is whether or not you're an organ donor. Their goal, objective, training, and everything that they're doing is to save your life. Matter of fact, transplant surgeons, transplant nurses, staff, they're nowhere near an emergency room. They're not an emergency room. Uh, to put that into numbers and so on, like the New York metro region, right? Live on New York's responsible for, you know, this population of 13 million lives across 100 hospitals, right? Good, 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 good numbers for people. 
a hundred of those hospitals in that hundred hospitals, only nine of them have transplant centers. The rest of them are academic medical centers, community hospitals, what we call donor hospitals. There's no association to transplant whatsoever. So those emergency rooms, the ICUs, critical care teams and staff, they are there to save your life until unfortunately sometimes they cannot. Um, and you know, and you're gravely ill or something so traumatic that you come into that environment. And every single patient is called in or should be called in. And we can talk more about that to an organ procurement organization in that region, whoever has that, what's called a DSA, a donation service area. So the nurses or physicians call us when somebody has a grave prognosis or there are clinical indicators leading to, we should call. We then go and search the databases to see, is this person an organ donor in New York, in the national database, at the DMV or another state? That's where that process really begins. So that's another big um, myth and legend. Another one right out of the movies is, uh, oh, if you're an organ donor, um, you have to have a closed casket funeral. My loved one won't be able to be seen by family. It's just That's just not true. It's not true. Um, no differently than um, surgery or an autopsy or anything else that may take place when it comes to organ donation. Um, that is not um, that is not true. That's a myth. Um, and yeah, there's countless others that come mostly from media, from um, Hollywood, uh, from a host of other areas. Hold on, so wow. to speak. Thank yeah, you for so, demystifying those. I think there's just sometimes it's common sense isn't so common and yeah, people yeah. somehow. And, and, and here's the thing, though. I'll, I'll tell you again, like of these 10 of them, I, I probably believed five of them for most of my life. Just again, as a New Yorker, as you know, listening to, you know, watching movies and stuff. So I totally get it. Once again, I totally get it. Um, so you could consider me a convert, if you will. Let's, let's switch gears a little bit. When you mentioned around um, databases, how 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 are you guys innovating? How are you trying to really transform what LiveOn is doing from a technological perspective, from a process perspective? Any to the degree that you're able to share. Obviously, we're not trying to yeah, um, sure. have you reveal any think, IP, but you know, maybe some yeah. little wins and maybe even some learnings as well. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? So the a lot of people ask the question, um, and to give some context to it, in about 22, 23 months, just short of two years, um, our gracious community, live on working with our gracious community who decided to give these gifts of life, uh, has been able to achieve um, approximately 50% increase in tissue donors, a 50% increase in organ donors, and a 50% increase in the organs successfully transplanted into those on the wait list around the country. So that's an those are extraordinary numbers, right? Um, you know, the exact numbers are roughly 48, uh, 52, and 51, right? But approximately 50% in each of those categories. A lot of people say, you know, how do you do this? What magic tricks are you pulling? Where's, you know, the innovative aspect of what you've done? Believe it or not, um, we have not done anything incredibly novel or innovative yet. Our strategic plan called for the investment of people, structure, and process to build on that with accountability, self-accountability, looking at ourselves and our own structures, policies, compliance, procedures, and then looking at the community to hold accountable to the regs and laws, and then building up from there to create collaborative partnerships and engagements um, you know, with community, with our donor hospitals, um, with the organ donation and transplant community. And then when that is solidified and we have our operating model, our compliance and policies in place, and we believe we have something no differently than building a startup or tech or anything else, yeah. when we know that we have the operating system intact, then we will look at technology, innovation, and up to and through, including commercialization, to replicate scale and build on that to help the broader community, right? So we're we're just at that line before we step into education, innovation, research, commercialization, and moving there. 
because we want to make sure like any responsible organization or if you were building a company, um, which we are, we're rebuilding a company. This is a turnaround. It's, it's building a plane in mid-flight. It's a turnaround. Levon has a long history of nearing decertification for a decade. We were recertified and we were brought in to turn this around, right? But when you look at that being responsible and who are, if we were a company, who are investors? Community. Who are we responsible to? Our community. Who's depending on us? Our community, right? So the value there is giving that value back to community. So I say that because people ask the question and they assume we've done something really dramatic, which we will, not yet, but they assume we have. When in fact, what we actually did was we went back to 30 to 40 years of the original thesis, the original intent of how organ procurement organizations were set up, why they exist, who they're here for, who the client customer was, community families, people who say yes to donation. We went back, we saw how far the industry came away from that thesis, and we went back to it. I, I, I would love to tell you that we've done anything other than that. But what we did was we followed the laws, the regulations, the policy, and the original intent of why this existed. What's happened over time is we've gotten far away from that original intent to serve the public, serve the community, serve the grace and the goodwill of people who want to leave this precious gift to others. And when we look back at it, we first look back about 10 years, then 15, then 25. I mean, this started in 1968, progressed through the 70s to early 80s. If you read the original documents, and I nod my head to CMS and to the regulators, because when you actually read the original intent and what this was intended to do, and it makes me realize so much about healthcare generally, we've just gotten far away from keeping the patient, keeping the donor, keeping the community at the center of what we do. And we've created a tremendous amount of noise and we went back to the signal and the single signal said, this was created to stand up for people who no longer have a voice, who are donors, you cannot have a recipient without a donor. Get back to the original language, just the definition, donor, recipient. It's, it's all there, right? But we've mystified these things. We've complicated them. So if we've done anything innovative, it's been diligence and discovery of the original and intent and thesis of very smart and innovative people 40 years ago who said this needs to exist for this reason. And we've gotten back to the core element. The thing that we've done regarding technology or, or data, if anything, is we're extremely data-driven. We're evidence-based. Um, we've invested in data. We are constantly iterating, tweaking, failing, breaking, fixing, and learning. As a living organism, we are looking at the data, looking at the community, trying new things. New York is a unique environment. I don't want to hold it uh, up or down or, or side to side to any other community, but there are logistical challenges here, um, technological challenges here, community issues here, right? You know, dozens of bridges here, right? Four seasons. Um, and the way, I, the reason I mention that is we live in a world where, you know, we're watching real life science fiction every day. We're watching the unbelievable talent of, of our transplant surgeons, of nurses, of staff, of allied health professionals, take an organ from a donor, gracious donor, put it into another human being and they can live. Think about that for a minute. We've solved I'm that. Right? Incredible, right? Like incredible. And what will kill you is traffic, fog, Logistical issues, technology shouldn't be that way. So a lot of people think we're a healthcare company. We happen to be a ton of nurses, paramedics, EMTs, physicians, surgeons. Um, people are running around in scrubs all day. We have staff deployed across a hundred hospitals. Yes, they think we're a healthcare company. The majority of what we do is logistics, right? So yeah. what will get in the way 
of saving a life. And what will get in the way of a donor making that gift is driving in a blizzard from Manhattan to Stony Brook with a liver. Traffic, fog, downing planes, protests, civil unrest, bridges being closed, floods, that should never be. When you think of the unbelievable miracle of medical advancement and science to be able to do what can be done, logistics should never be the reason somebody has to die. So the OPO exists from the moment somebody says yes, or their family member says yes, to that moment of the worst time of that family's life and that individual's life to hold their hand, to get them through that process in the hospital, all the way to going to the operating room where that gracious gift is given from that donor, procuring the organs as those gifts of life, which could be up to eight, and then managing all of the logistics based on that federal wait list with that algorithm to organize each of those organs going to all different parts of the United States to the sickest people on the list that match size, blood type, et cetera, et cetera. There are thousands of logistical variables there. The OPO's role ends when that delivery of that organ takes place to that transplant center and our, our work or responsibility is done. So we are the stewards of that gift through the entire process. I did not even know that until I was interviewed for this role and recruited to this role by the board. I didn't even realize that. I knew it kind of existed, but I did not realize the entire continuum of that all the way to the delivery and the logistical components of it. So, so there is a tremendous opportunity for innovation, for change, um, for regulations to support that. Uh, but for now, we've followed what's been done, gone back to the origin, and have been successful in doing that to honor our daughters in the community. It, it sounds like a, a part of the process of transformation and turnarounds is really about simplification, and you found the true north. I want right. to sort of maneuver over to a, a segment of the show. I'll call it Explain That Post. And I'm I'm so geeking out right now because um, you wrote a post and I'm going to quote. And I want you to kind of give a little bit more context. And, and you said this, I'm frequently asked how to turn around an organization with decades of operating a certain way in the healthcare industry that is resistant to change. I've been in the healthcare sector for 25 years. And the answer is you read the fine print. Follow the rules and regulations and execute on behalf of, in this case, the community of patients while focused on your true north. All the bullying and threats and intimidation tactics that come with changing an industry is, quote, unquote, the first through the wall gets bloody, end quote. This is about change regardless of industry. Newton's third law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And then you pointed to a video of Moneyball. This video sums up the why perfectly. Um, <laughs> I love that when you said that. That actually would spur me on to have you come on to the show. But can you maybe give the audience a little bit more uh, behind that? Yeah, so um, change for anyone. So theory and practice. So change isn't easy in practice. I'm an operator. No matter what, I am a nurse and NP and business person, you know, entrepreneur and um, whatever the labels are that people put on me. At the end of the day, I'm an operator. Um, when you're taking a city or a nation or whatever, an ecosystem, right? One of the most resistant documented healthcare, right? One of the most resistant to change um, environments on the planet, industries on the planet. Um, when you're taking that, and you're going 30, 40 years back to a thesis and you're saying to everybody, hey, we're actually going to follow the rules, the regs, and the law, you, believe it or not, get an unbelievable reaction of resistance to it. And in my 20, entire 25 years, um, I've got a lot of experience in dealing with that and managing it. Um, I've never experienced it so concentrated and in such a forceful way in this industry, in the OPO industry, in the organ donation and transplant industry. Um, and to unpack that a little bit, 
I don't expect people to remember all the time that regs laws were written 20 years ago um, because I didn't even know they existed. So I get it, right? There's, you know, five pages in a book of a thousand pages that our ecosystem has to be held accountable to. So what's happened is on arrival, the biggest question that I'm called about or asked about or challenged about or threatened about is, hey, why'd you change everything? Why didn't you let us know that the laws changed? Why didn't you let us know that the regs changed? We've got to do change management in order to get ready for all this change. And my response is, these changed 40 years ago. Now, once again, I'm speaking to my former self because I didn't know better either, right? So when it doesn't matter if it's the organ organization industry, the donation and transplant industry, it doesn't matter if it's innovation, doesn't matter if it's operating a hospital or in the broader healthcare ecosystem. When you introduce a new operating model, when you introduce any change to an ecosystem, it challenges convention and there is a reaction to it collectively. The, I guess, not new lesson, but the thing that is curious to me or not curious to me anymore, but something that surprised me was, again, there's nothing incredibly innovative here being done. We're simply holding ourselves responsible and the community responsible, the broader healthcare ecosystem community to rules and regulations that have been written for decades, but they were never enforced. So there's no teeth behind them. There are a lot of regs and rules out there um, that there's no accountability for or no responsibility to, right? So that post was the culmination of my of my life being a change agent, trying new things, doing different things, but coming together at this acute moment of the unbelievable resistance to change as we do something to improve quality of life and the ability to save lives through the gracious act of donation. And I've written about this. I've called it, you know, organizational or systemic autoimmune disease. And it's when a body, in this case, the healthcare ecosystem, may identify something beneficial to its to its or to itself as a foreign object and attack it. It happens at a unit level, it happens at an institutional level, it happens you know, at an ecosystem level, whether that's a city or an industry, and I'm sure it's not unique to healthcare, it's yeah. the old, it's a very long way to say people are resistant to change. So the other part of that post was that we are using data and we're being very transparent about data to push it out publicly and share it locally to show where there are inadequacies, whether those are our own or the broader community that are getting in the way of saving lives. So the, the correlation to Moneyball and the reference to Moneyball was that line of the first one through the wall that gets bloodied. We're not the first one through the wall from a novel sense or an innovative sense, but we're the first one through the wall locally in a very long time, reminding everybody that these rules and regs exist, which look like innovative, new, aggressive, assertive models being introduced, when in fact, they're probably on microfilm. So using the data to do that um, is amazing. It's amazing when you sit there and you have to say, uh, that was 1968. Um, that was 1982. Um, nope, didn't make that one up. That's actually a law. <laughs> Makes you think more broadly about healthcare where I wonder how many other instances there are where we could go back to the origin Patient, 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 community, 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 right? In this case, donor, 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 where we could go back and look at the original intent and say, wow, you know what? They they actually kind of had it right. And then it makes me think of the cycles in healthcare that we see. And we see them in those 15, 20, 30 year cycles where an idea from 1995 becomes great again. We splash technology on it. We call it something else. We give it a different acronym. And it's the next best thing since sliced bread. Um, and there's tremendous waste in, in our system when it does that. And it ultimately doesn't lead to helping people because it's been done before. 
tried before and we failed before at it. And I've watched, forget this role. I mean, I've watched that cycle for 25 years. So that's where, that's what that post was all about. Really appreciate you on unpa unpacking that. And <laughs> I kind of equate um, what you're doing in terms of each of your journeys as a, as a painting, as a piece of art. And you're an artist at heart. So I'm yep. curious, I'm curious, when do you know when a painting is finished? Because if I sort of track your career to where you are now, when did you know that it was time to start a new painting? Like, can you talk yeah. through that a little bit? Sure, it's a great question. So, um, you know, and I, I teach about this, I talk about it. So let me start by saying we all have two resumes. And I talk about that. There's our unwritten resume with all our failures. And I've got plenty of them where I thought I'd make a left and I made a right. I thought I could do something and I didn't. I thought I could iterate and I didn't. I thought I had an idea and it couldn't be executed or it got it didn't get through the, the valley of death per se, right? So we've got that resume. And that's not the LinkedIn post. That's not the LinkedIn profile, right? <laughs> and then we've got this other resume and this profile that has all of our success on it, right? And the more valuable thing to talk about and contribute to the world are our failures. You know, when I talk to students or mentor, sponsor, when, when, I, when I try to talk about this, and it's why I'm talking about it now, the most valuable things you could share are the things that you had to throw away. The things that you messed up that went in the waste paper basket. So when it comes to my art, yeah, I'm allegedly an artist, people, allegedly like my stuff um and um i've been blessed to you know be able to um you know be in a lot of galleries and sell art and, and again i have collectors and stuff like that what they don't see is that i have destroyed more canvases than i've sold i've trashed more than anyone's ever hung up no differently than in commercialization or the entrepreneurial voyage or technology anybody who's ever built anything knows that that voyage is the voyage of success that looks more like a scattershot plot of this and not that. Um, and the reason I start with that is it's important context and, and, and I wanna make sure the audience understands this when I say it. Um, I'd say a 10 to one ratio of canvases I've trashed versus something I'd show the world. And how do I know when it's done? Um, for me, I mean, the, 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 the real process is I'm never satisfied and I never think that something's done, but I'll finish something. I think I'm finished with it. And I actually will leave it somewhere so that when I wake up the next morning, I could see it. My wife does not like this process. It's often right there in the bedroom or in the dining room table right before Thanksgiving. And that's actually a real story right now. I have probably 30 pieces on the dining room table. And, um, but I wake up and I look at it that morning and I say, is it done? And if not, I leave it there and I'll do it again and again and again until the answer is yes. Um, very rarely do I finish a piece and know that it's done. Very rarely um, does that happen, but it's mostly me looking at it, iterating on it, continuing to shape it it's like a living organism and you're right it is how I've um to me I'm not a healthcare executive and an entrepreneur or an investor and a healthcare guy and an artist I'm I'm just a single person and the application of that is true in no matter what I do no differently than um, any role I've ever had or building anything um, but yeah the piece you just kind of know when you get there, you just kind of know. Um, sometimes I know on the spot and I'll set it aside. I don't, I, I like what I paint. I don't love what I paint. Other people, you know, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? Art's in the eye of the beholder. I think it's the same with when we're building, iterating, challenging convention or changing things. Um, you have to have an appetite for risk. You have to have an appetite um, for the voyage. It requires Pepto-Bismol. It's, it's an up and down ride. Um, and when I say that, even with my art, there are times that I'll do a piece made out of wood and Scrabble pieces and Legos and resin, and I'll look at it 
it would take me a month to make it. And then I decide, you know what? I'm going to go put it in my backyard um, in my fire pit and light it on fire and see what the effect is with the risk of a month's worth of work completely melting on me or me not being able to pull it out of there in time. And um, those are some of my best pieces. So the appetite for experimentation and risk, you have to be real with yourself you know, anything that I've ever built might look like a few beautiful omelets, but I probably broke a dozen eggs to make them. It's the same with art. It's the same with entrepreneurship. It's the same with business. It's the same with investing. It's the same with building what we're building today. Um, so that's kind of how I tie that all together. I've never thought about that or been asked that before, but um, that's kind of how I tie that together, if that makes sense. So appreciate you articulating that. It was beautifully done. How can, how can our community follow your work, follow what Live On is doing? Maybe just kind of give a little, uh, yeah. as we end this, you know, how do we follow what you're doing and support it? Yeah, so, you know, Live On New York, it's 350 unbelievably talented professionals. Again, I don't want anyone to think that it's been some joyride um, in getting here. The joy is in having the, gastrointestinal fortitude to make change on behalf of a forgotten community and be very serious and relentless about it and try our best to engage and educate and advocate along the way. Um, so um, donation, organ and tissue donation is a beautiful thing. I would encourage anyone out there to just please just learn about it, right? We we respect, we're we're, we're into human rights and we respect everybody's right to say yes or no to donation. That's going to sound incredibly controversial to many of my colleagues and people in the industry, but New Yorkers, um, our, our population we serve, only 20% of the people that our staff approach in the hospital by the time that moment in their life comes at the end of their life, only 20% of them are registered donors in our area. In other states, that's 70 or 80%. So our staff have to get 80% of the time, they have to get a family member or a loved one to understand everything we've just talked about and donation and the beauty of it. And then they have to choose a yes or no. There's two paths to donation. First person donor, that's you at the DMV saying yes, or your loved ones or family saying, hey, I know what Lenny represented in life. He would want to be a donor. 80% of the time, our staff has to manage that scenario. In a lot of states, that's only 15, 20% of the time, right? And the, you know, the reason that I bring that up is it's okay if the answer is no. Our job is to make sure everyone is asked and everyone has the opportunity to have that legacy for their loved one to live on and for somebody else to live on and have generational impact. That's our role to step in there to make sure everybody's given that opportunity. So think about donation, learn about donation. Um, dispel the myths, the urban legends that some of which I even believe, um, go and register to be an organ donor if you like, or at the least tell your family members, you know what, if something ever happens to me, this is the last gift. This is my last right um, that I want. I want to be able to save a life and live on and help others live on through organ donation. Uh, you could go on liveonny.org you could go on the state registry, the national registry, the DMV. You could do it that way. Or once again, we absolutely respect everyone's right not to. We just want everybody to have the opportunity to now that we know better. And the blank has been filled in for us around the world. Lenny, it's been just amazing to have you come on and just, I love it when guests come on and they're just super passionate. Um, <laughs> not, not every guest is super passionate. Every guest is interesting that, there are times when we have guests that are interesting and passionate and it's a real it's delightful to to hear this i couldn't also help but think you know looking at your background physically where it says live on new york and i know right now your area of focus is foundationally building up new york because there's just when you're trying to erect a massive skyscraper you need a really deep strong foundation have you envisioned this being 
broader or outside of New York? Outside, I mean, because when I think of live on New York, like I think of just live on. You just said it. You said live yeah. on. Like that can be something that can be global in a sense. But not yeah, to get too far ahead of ourselves. But yeah, we talk about it. So the so um, just like building anything, right? We want to make sure that we actually have a real operating model here, right? That there's not get the get the you know signal to noise ratio right. Make sure that what we have is scalable and replicable. And it doesn't mean our focus is, you know, in our DSA, that's what we want to excel at. Um, I think that the entire community can give each other best practices. I think that live on just for the same reason people come to New York because of data, right? The, you know, hundreds of languages, the hundreds of variables, the logistical challenges, right? We've got all four seasons. There's a lot to learn about operating in that environment that once we get it right, and we're not there yet, but once we get it right, then we will start that education, research, innovation, and we will look to scale and grow. And the scale and grow may be through several vehicles, education, innovation, commercialization. It, may, it doesn't necessarily mean like in the greater sense of what's changing with regulation, going into other areas and building Levons everywhere. That, that's not, you know, that's not on the roadmap per se. What is on the roadmap is how can others learn through this regulatory moment of awakening and change? What's going to change in the ecosystem? What mistakes were learned that we could save others from learning? What did mistakes did they make that they could pass on to us so we don't have to make them? And how do we all learn together? A good example of that, Live on New York in the last 22, 23 months has had 4 billion unpaid media views, impressions. 4 billion with a B for a small entity. And all of them were around our organ donor heroes and their families, right? But th that was national and international news. Our strategic decision wasn't just to do local news. Our decision was when we have an opportunity to raise that level of water for all ships, th we will. If we yes. have that, and it's a very small example, but you better believe somebody in another state or another country saw a story out of New York about one of our officers or firemen or, or sanitation or teachers or kids or any of these unbelievable gracious donors, and it changed their mind about donation. So we want to almost contribute in that way. Um, and we're an underdog. We've got a lot to do. Um, we were one of the worst in the country. And, you know, we do want to be the best. What is the best? The best is a collective best. We want everyone to win because winning is more lives saved than ever. Winning is not stopping generational impact of even economics, right? I mean, so many people, 80% of the wait list is on dialysis. Michael, they're waiting for kidneys. They're not able to work. They're on disability. They're not able to contribute, right? Even to their own children's ability to continue to prosper and have economic opportunity. So this is, yes, life, which is the most important, but the economic impact of this to the payer, yes. to the kids in the system, to the taxpayer, to all, and to that individual who we need to get back to a quality of life to start to create value for themselves and community creates a generational flywheel of impact. And that's a whole other segment on the economics of this. Um, but yeah, we see us playing, we, we see playing a role in all of that, either through observation or assistance or receiving from others, how to continue to grow together nationally and improve donation. We'll have to do it again because the downstream implications of what you're doing are absolutely significant. And for those that are tuned in, just want to say, if you found the content in today's conversation really helpful for you, number one, would you just mind sharing it on your social media, uh, even commenting? A any type of engagement is, is is super helpful. And Lenny, you've been very gracious with your time today. So I just want to say thanks thank for everything. Appreciate, appreciate the mission, that. what you're doing. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, look forward to having you come back on sometime soon. All right, be well. Thanks, everybody. Take care.